Good afternoon, welcome back folks to Advanced Higher Chemistry. This is the second time I've tried this video because apparently I'm unable to operate my camera correctly, so let's see if this works. We want to talk today about the wonderful world of thermodynamics, which is all about the movement of heat, or originally was all about the movement of heat in the history. I might try and put a link to a historical video um, up here somewhere to do with it. Uh, it was first studied to do with machines and engines. It's been found to have much deeper consequences than just heat, though. Um, so let's, the SQA, by the way, call it reaction feasibility. I'm not sure that's the best word in the world to use for it. We'll have, maybe have a look why later on. SQA, 73 to 75. And here are the points I'm going to cover in the video today. The video today is just going to cover the theory, because uh, that'll be long enough. And I'll make another one, part two, on some exemplar, exemplar? exemplar questions the SQA have asked uh, but on this topic over the years. So I think we'll cover the standard entropy of formation, the definition of it, and how to calculate it. You need to know both. Then we'll have a look at why some reactions happen spontaneously. I don't mean they pop out the cupboard and go boo, or they have a really great idea to go on a road trip. Spontaneously, in this case, means the reaction once started, or sometimes will start by itself at a given temperature. You don't have to push it to make it react all the time. That should sound familiar to an old word, perhaps from National 5, a reaction that happens by itself, some to do with heat. Hmm. We'll come back to that. I have said maybe, by the way. We'll have a look at a new concept called entropy. You should see my garage. Um, that's basically entropy embodied in reality. And number four, we'll have a look at the real reasons for spontaneous reactions. Let's start with the definition of the standard enthalpy of formation, which I had already, oh come on, I already have on the sheet underneath because I had done it before my camera went in the huff. Standard enthalpy of formation is the enthalpy change when one mole of a product is formed from its elements in their standard states. Now I'm going to underline in green areas the SQA love to trick you with this. Uh, you're making one mole, uh, but it's the product this time. Remember the standard enthalpy of combustion at higher. You had to burn one mole of fuel on the left-hand side of the arrow. Well, this time you have to make one mole of product on the right. All the other balancing numbers need to be adjusted so you're only making one mole of the product. It's being formed from its elements. So you can't have any compounds over here on the left of the arrow. Um, and their elements need to be in their standard states. What on earth does standard state mean? Also, before I go any further, let's underline standard states here in green, and we're going to change this symbol ever so slightly. We're going to put a little circle up there. Because that circle there is the same as standard conditions. Let's have a look at what standard conditions mean. They mean, unless the paper specifies otherwise, it's a little bit of a grey area. Been trying to do some reading and see exactly... Anyway, let's, let's not worry about that. As far as we're concerned for the SQA, you have a standard temperature and a standard pressure. The pressure is one atmosphere. In other words, what we're probably sitting in in this room just now, unless you're seeing this at the bottom of the ocean, which is quite impressive. And the temperature is an interesting one because at this point, we're going to change the way we measure temperature. We're going to use a proper scale, which is the Kelvin scale, and it's going to be 298 Kelvin. How do we get to Kelvin? Well, the answer is you take the degree Celsius and you add uh, 273, sorry, I had brain, a brainwave for a second there. You add 273 Kelvin to it. So if you can work backwards from this, that means the standard condition temperature is 25 degrees C, which is quite toasty. 25 degrees C in a room, a little bit warm for my comfort. So that's what standard conditions are. That's what's donated by this little, donated, denoted, sorry. That's what what's denoted by this little circle up here, and it means this is happening at standard conditions, one atmosphere, and 298 Kelvin. If you don't know why I think we should be measuring in Kelvin all the time, I might put a link up here to my higher chemistry video, in which case we discuss the true nature of what actual temperature is. Anyway, um, so that's the definition. How do we calculate it? Well, I'm going to refer us to the formula sheet in our data books for a second because it turns out they've got three things that are actually useful for a change here. That's a bit harsh, isn't it? Um, we have got one, we've got two, and we've got, th actually, there are four things that are useful. Um, one, two, three, four, but we'll come back to them through this topic. 
at the moment, we're only really interested in this first one here, which says that the enthalpy change under standard conditions, in other words, the enthalpy of formation of a substance is equal to the sum of all the enthalpy of formation of the products, take away the sum of all the enthalpies of formations of the reactants. This will probably become more obvious what this means when I show you an example of it. Uh, I'm tempted to... Yeah, let, let's do one. Why not? Let's do one. Let's try and make some... What could we make? We could make some ethene, couldn't we? C2... No, let's make some ethane, in fact. Oh, it's not going to make any difference. I'm being an idiot. Um, so let's make some ethane. Now, the standard enthalpy of formation of this delta HF would mean that I'd have to take some carbon when it's a solid and I'd need to cook it up with some hydrogen and it's got to be H2 because that's its normal state and it would also be a gas. We will need three of these to give us six hydrogens and we'll need two of these in order that we're only making one mole. So how would you calculate it? Well, once again, data book actually gives you uh, page 11 of the data book gives you some standard enthalpy of formations for a variety of things here. Now, we could cheat and just look up this, um, but we're not going to. Uh, this is not the best example in the world, but my point being that if we follow this formula, I apologize, I'll come up with a better SQA example. We need the delta HF of all the products take away the delta HF of all the reactants. So the product in this case would simply be one molecule of ethane. So you'd take uh, the delta HF um, of an ethane molecule, whatever number that happens to be, and from that you would take two times the delta HF of carbon, because we need two carbons, uh, and three of the delta HF of hydrogens. And whatever this uh, calculation here gives you will be the enthalpy, standard enthalpy of formation um, of ethane. Let's move on to my second topic, which is maybe the reason that some reactions happen spontaneously. Talking about spontaneously, I need some more paper. Excuse me. Okay, let's have a look at this. This is burning stuff. One of my favourite reactions here. Um, and I'm fairly sure the last time I checked that once I light a flame, a methane a Bunsen burner in the classroom, the reaction just continues by itself, continues to burn. Now, you might be tempted to say, of course it continues to burn, because this is this reaction, like all reactions, has a change in enthalpy. The total enthalpy of all these bonds, I should balance it, by the way, highly unprofessional, sorry. Um, there we go, that's more like it. So the total enthalpy of this side and the total enthalpy of this side are very different to each other. And therefore, there is an enthalpy change. This particular reaction, the enthalpy stored in these bonds is much higher than the enthalpy stored in these bonds. So this change in enthalpy comes out into the room. From the molecule's point of view, these have dropped in enthalpy. So we say that delta H is negative for this reaction. And this was called, of course, an exothermic reaction. Now, common sense would say, well, the reason this happens, this reaction, by itself, is because once you start it, once you add a little click, and then you burn the first few molecules of this, you'll create these and you dump a whole load of energy, which then knocks into the neighboring molecules of this, which breaks them apart, which releases more energy, and it just continues in a little cycle. That is true. That is very, very true. But I've got a prop here. Now, red moment there. I've got a prop here uh, involving the very high-tech substance of a block of ice in my glass of water. Now, the ice is busy melting there. Once that reaction uh, starts, I don't have to keep it going. But there's a problem, because melting ice is endothermic. You've got to continuously put energy into that ice to make it melt. That's why the water cools down, just in case you haven't actually figured that out. That's why we add ice drinks. Cheers. 
because I now have a nice cold glass of water. So if H2O going from solid to H2O liquid is still, so this reaction here, this was spontaneous. And delta H is negative. This reaction here is definitely spontaneous. Once my ice has started melting, once I take it out of the freezer, I can't stop it. Oh, without putting it back in the freezer again. But there's a problem here, <laughs> because this reaction is endothermic. Delta H is positive for this reaction. It is endothermic. So why does it happen by itself? There must be something that we are not aware of so far that's driving this reaction here. And in case you haven't guessed or you've got short-term memory, this leads us on to my third topic of entropy. Some people just want to watch the world burn, eh? They just crave a disorder. Now, entropy, which is given the letter S, is basically the state of disorder of a system. Low entropy values are highly ordered. They're nice and neat and tidy and structured. Dr. Borthwick's room. Higher S values are less ordered or more disordered, more random. Okay, so that is the concept of entropy. It's given the letter S. Before we go any further, by the way, should talk about units just before we leave this behind because there is a classic trap here from the SQA. Delta H is always quoted. Sorry. Crossing over my own diagram, very unprofessional. Delta H is kilojoules per mole. That's the standard unit for enthalpy changes. I have to stop and say my words very carefully here in case I mix up enthalpy and entropy. It's easily done. I don't want to screw up things for you. S, entropy, tends to be measured in joules per kelvin per mole. Um, is that going to cause us problems? Not really. There's a way around about that. We'll come back to that in the very near future. So this is our new concept here. Um, entropy is given the letter S and it's the state of disorder of a system. So my garage is a dump because I don't put stuff in away often enough. So my garage is a very high entropy. Um, a house of cards, once it's stacked up, has a very low entropy. And that card analogy is a good one because uh, of one of the laws of thermodynamics that you're required to know. But before we leave entropy behind, I knew there was something my subconscious was tickling to me about. Um, we need to have a look at the entropy of substances. Why should my glass of water, why should the liquid water... Oh no, I've given away the answer. I've got a big mouth. Liquid water has a higher entropy than solid water. And there's a very simple reason for that. Let's have a look at it graphically, and we'll also have a look at it in common sense terms too. So if we plot entropy here against temperature, and please remember that we're only using the proper scales from now There is no degree before Kelvin, by the way. I, in the past times, believe it or not, the SQ, I've taken marks off you if you put a degree before Kelvin, for maybe geeky reasons or pedantic reasons that I might go into in the next video. But they are right. There is no circle there. It's just K. So S versus a temperature. You get a line that looks, in theory, like this. Now, if you go down to zero Kelvin, which is absolute zero, which we can never quite get to, by the way, then you should have zero entropy. So you should get a perfect crystal at that point. This is wandering into physics territory, isn't it, where they say the thing, things like we can neglect air resistance and so on. So perfect crystals should exist, uh, but don't, because you can't get to absolute zero, but the SQA wants you to know about it anyway. So you get this sort of graph here. This means that as you increase the temperature, because the atoms and molecules start to shake more, or vibrate more quickly, things become more disordered. But if you continue to plot this, you get, oh, sorry about that noise, you get this sort of graph. 
Now, if I've done this right, <laughs> not only have I drawn over my own diagrams, but we can pop... What's going on here? I mean, this slope is fine, but why has it jumped up twice? Want to pause the video and take a guess? This is the entropy of H2O. So let's pop some temperatures in here. That is 273. And this temperature here is 373. In other words, known as 0 Celsius. Sorry, degrees C. 0 degrees C and 100 degrees C. So, as you can see, there's a heck of a jump in entropy when there is a phase change. So this is ice, this is water, and this is steam. So we can see that entropy increases with temperature and also there are massive jumps whenever the substance changes phase from solid to liquid. Solid, all nice and locked up and regular. Liquid, moving around to gas. Wee! Bye-bye, order. Hello, entropy. Okay, let's move on to uh, two of the laws of thermodynamics the SQA require you to know, folks. They won't take long, though. <clears throat> you just have to know three of them. They only want you to know, slightly bizarrely, they only want you to know the second and third laws of thermodynamics these days. So the second law of TD. Let me just pause. There's no point you watching me write things out. Okay, and a sudden... Um, Shocking twist of plot. I thought I'd do the third law first, which we've actually done because the third law is summed up in this concept here, useless as it is, that at zero Kelvin, there would be zero entropy, so therefore you would get perfect crystals. Um, the second law of thermodynamics, slightly more interesting though, um, in terms of machinery and operations and just generally the heat death of the universe, in fact. The second law of thermodynamics says that for any spontaneous process to happen, then there must be an overall increase in entropy. So delta S must be going up. So things that happen by themselves, things that you don't have to force to happen, always leads to an increase in entropy of the system that's round about them. Uh, that's the second law of thermodynamics. That is related to my house of cards, as in it's very difficult to build a house of cards and it's incredibly easy for them to fall down by themselves because a house of cards, when it's built, is ordered as a low entropy and the action of falling down increases the entropy. The cards are now scattered randomly instead of set in a lovely precise pattern. So that's a real world application of this, interestingly. Um, where are we going next? We are going back to my learning outcomes sheet in which I said I wanted to introduce the concept of entropy to you. How are we doing so far? Let's get the learning outcomes back again. Done. Um, that is what we thought would happen for exothermic reactions, but it turns out like my melting ice is not exothermic, so there must be, oops, something else at play. Must be entropy. Let's have a look at the real reason for spontaneous reactions happening. We sort of have done this-ish. That goes with an increase in entropy. But it's not quite as simple as that because not all reactions that have an increase in entropy are spontaneous. So there must be one last thing that we are missing. This is our final concept for today, guys. Gibbs free energy, delta G. By the way, these are all standard conditions, so I suppose we should have our little zeros in here, shouldn't we? So delta G is not really a thing as such. It's more of a mathematical definition, but it's really handy because it will let us truly tell whether a reaction will happen spontaneously by itself or not. Spontaneous with a question mark. That's what this term will let us see. Now on this side here, we've got our delta H for endo or exothermic reactions. And we've got this term here, T delta S, which is linked to the entropy change for a given reaction. Basically, let's take the most favourable case first of all. The most favourable case for reaction happening would be when this was exothermic. In other words, this is negative. And we just learned, according to the second law, spontaneous reactions cause an increase in entropy. So T delta S would be a positive term. So we start with a number that's already negative, and we're taking away positive numbers from it, which means the sum of everything is going to be definitely negative. And that is the best case scenario for a spontaneous reaction. 
delta G is negative. Um, what about some other uh, conditions? What about the worst case scenario for a spontaneous reaction? What if we had an endothermic reaction and you were having a drop in entropy? Now you've got a positive term to start with and you're taking away negative, so you're making it even more positive. So Gibbs energy here would be positive. This is never spontaneous. This one here, this setup here, this is always spontaneous. So this reaction will happen by itself at all temperatures. This reaction here, for a given reaction, will never happen by itself at any temperature ever. So what about the case of my ice melting? Because I said ice melting is an endothermic reaction, but I also said that there's an increase in entropy. So my entropy term is increasing. And what comes into play here, remember I said I'd have to stick it back in the freezer. So this term here suddenly becomes really important. Because if you have a look at this for a second, we are starting positive, which is bad news in terms of spontaneity. However, you are subtracting T times delta S. So this is a fixed number here. This is a variable number here. You can do this reaction at different temperatures, which means that if T is large enough, then you start positive, you're subtracting a big enough number from it. This means your delta G can actually end up as negative. This is the one the SQE love to ask you about. Because this situation is always spontaneous, this situation is never spontaneous, this situation here will happen above a certain temperature. When T is large enough, then the overall value of delta G will change from being positive, it will change through zero, and then it will click over into negative. And in fact, that point at which delta G just becomes zero, that's your transition temperature where this reaction will become spontaneous. They love asking that. They often ask you to calculate the temperature at which a given reaction will just become feasible, is the word they use. So the equation here is delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. In this case, they would usually ask you to calculate the delta H value, which, as I said, will come out positive. They'll usually ask you to calculate the delta S value. I'll show you how to do that. Um, just before we leave, I'll show you how to do that as well. Um, and they'll ask you to calculate the temperature at which this reaction just becomes feasible. This isn't mentioned anywhere simply because the change over temperature is when that just becomes zero. So you can do some very simple maths or rearrangement. They often ask the temperature. So that means T delta S uh, equals negative delta... No, 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 it doesn't. Sorry. T delta S equals delta H. Get your maths right here. Which means T equals delta H um, over delta S. There is one thing to be wary of. If you cash your minds back, remember I mentioned units. Units can be tricky here because entropy is in joules per Kelvin and enthalpy is in kilojoules per Kelvin. So you could end up having something, say, plus 25 for the delta H. This could be perhaps um, 150, but it, this is joules per Kelvin, that's kilojoules. So you actually end up with 25 over, did I say 150? Yes, I did, 0 0.15. Now that's joules into kilojoules. I've divided by a thousand. Is there something I... Yes, my subconscious was telling me that I had left something behind. Let's flick just back to the data book. Remember I said... Can I zoom in on this before we go? Well, my camera, let me zoom in. Not really, I'm sorry about that. There, is, uh, there are three little equations on how to calculate delta H, delta S, and delta G. And they're all exactly identical. They're the same format. They're the sum of the delta of whatever it is you're dealing with of the products. Take away the sum of the deltas of the reactants, whether that's enthalpy, entropy, or in fact, Gibbs free energy as well. I have seen them use that a couple of times. I'll try and put that in my example video. And just in case you've forgotten this, it's in there as well. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. 
And I think that's all I want to say just now, folks, until I come back with some actual examples um, on what we had to do. So going back to the learning outcomes and to, just to round off, yeah, the real reason for spontaneous reactions involves delta S, yes, and involves delta G. That is true as well. Uh, delta G, sorry, guys. It involves delta H and it involves um, delta S. Um, but they invented this term delta G, um, which is basically the mathematical difference of it. And there are certain, for some reactions, there are certain temperatures that the this will become negative and the reaction will become spontaneous at. Other reactions, delta G is always positive and it's never spontaneous. By the way, the reaction still happens. It's just that you have to force it to happen all the time. And there are some reactions where delta G is always negative at any temperature, which means the reaction is spontaneous at every single temperature. Thanks for listening, folks. Bye-bye for just now. I'll see you in part two where I will tackle along with you some example calculations for thermodynamics.